Welcome to And That's the Game Podcast. Presented by Pro Batter Sports. And That's the Game is hosted by Wayne Mazzoni. Today's special guest is Eric Holtz. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of And That's the Game podcast, sponsored by Pro Batter Sports. I'm your host, Wayne Mazzoni. On this episode, we have Eric Holtz. I'd like to give Eric a particular title, but he has a massive background in all of sports, so that by the time you'll hear this interview, you'll realize here's a guy with, with a multitude of, of you know jobs and different uh, things that you can learn from in terms of running his own business, his college experience. Uh, now he manages Game On 13, a facility with travel teams in Elmsford, New York. He was the Israeli Olympic uh, manager, which is a, a great story that he tells. So Eric has a non-traditional background compared to the typical guests we get on this podcast. But I think in, in some ways you'll learn a whole lot because of that, because of his varied background. So I hope you enjoy this episode with Eric Holtz. So Eric, I'm very pumped to have you on this podcast. We've probably had many of these conversations, not in a podcast form, but now we're recording this one. And then in two weeks, I'll be on your podcast, which, which should be great. Um, and I also like having a guest like you where I know a lot, like I probably know you better than maybe all the other podcast guests, but there's still probably a lot of stuff that I don't know. So kind of with that, let me ask you a question that I really don't know the answer to. Sure. What was the young Eric Holtz like from an athlete standpoint? I know you're a, you know, totally a baseball guy. Was it only baseball growing up? Did you play a bunch of stuff? What, what were you like as a kid and through sports? So yeah, I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna... to teach you a little bit about me um some is not uh always sexy and exciting this is actually kind of sad um i was born with a birth defect in my lower spine called spondylolisthesis and you know in 1965 there wasn't a whole lot that they could do for it um so the options were um (laughs) there really was no option i had to wear a metal back brace from my chest down to my knees Um, other than when I was sleeping during the day, um, my mom, uh, at three years old, basically threw me in an Olympic size swimming pool because swimming was the best thing for a full body workout that they knew about in 1968. Um, so that being said, baseball for several reasons, but more, most important safety, right? I couldn't. I couldn't play tackle football because if I got hit the wrong way, uh, it could have jarred it. I would have had to have had my spine fused. Um, so baseball uh, was the most non-contact thing um, that in addition to my dad, um, you know, just being a huge Yankee fan. Uh, he was a huge Lou Gehrig guy. He actually, you know, uh, got to see Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth play baseball. Uh, so the combination of those two, Uh, made me a really good baseball player. That was what I focused on. I played everything. I mean, in the streets of the Bronx, I played everything. We played touch football, but I couldn't strap on equipment um, in in the fear of I couldn't couldn't skate because if I fell, I couldn't ride horses. There were a lot of things that I was limited to uh, as a young athlete because of that. So how about like, Let's say, obviously, you didn't now play formal football, but like just goofing around with buddies where you were you shooting hoops. Did you because you said swimming, did you ever become a legit swimmer? I did not become a legit swimmer, but I did become a lifeguard because it was a great way to pick up girls. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, uh, I did play uh, basketball through uh, high school. Uh, I did play soccer. I was a goalie because, again, my my baseball skill kind of helped me with cutting off angles and 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 you know getting balls and stuff. Um, it was really just tackle football. Uh, I played a lot of touch football. Um, really good hands, you know, both uh, as a receiver or or, or a D back, um, and I could run a little bit. So 
yeah, I mean, I, I was competitive um, in the streets of the Bronx, Co-op City, uh, but that was really, um, you know, that was all I could do. And then even at that time, see, in one way, I, I feel different than a lot of people in that I played a lot of sports growing up, but I really ultimately am a baseball football guy. I'm not locked into all kinds of stuff. When you were growing up, were you into hoops? Were you following hockey? Were you just a big sports guy or not really? I was a big sports guy. I'm going to say, <laughs> you know, my dad passed when I was 11 years old, Wayne, and he tried to make me a Jet fan. <laughs> and and I was smarter than him. <laughs> um, when he passed away, immediately, I saw these guys on TV that were they had the coolest uniforms and they were nasty and they were poking people in the eyes. And I became an Oakland Raider fan. So, yes, I, I became a Raider fan and a Nick guy and a Yankee guy. I, I mean, I always liked the Mets and I always like to see them do well, but I'm a Yankee fan at heart. Um, loved uh, the Knicks. I was a season ticket holder. Many people don't know that for, for many years through the Ewing and Oakley and Mason and Starks years uh, in the 90s. Um, never really a hockey guy, you know, hockey in the Bronx just wasn't a thing because, yeah. you know, we were rollerblading and, and, and roller skating and stuff. Um, so yeah, I was more, more football, basketball, baseball. And then even like today, like the Knicks had playoff game yesterday, you locked into that kind of thing, or is that, have you lost that a little bit? Um, I've lost it a little bit. Um, I, at this point, um, I'm very good friends with Donovan Mitchell, uh, the father and, and his son, who's obviously on the, you know, the Cleveland Cavaliers right now is kind of like a nephew. You know, he, he used to be our bat boy. We played men's baseball together and D Mitch was our, our, our bat boy, you know, for many years. So I really just pay more attention to see what Donovan's doing at this point. Right. Got it. Okay. Now, how about, once you got into high school, were you healthy enough to play baseball in high school? Tell me about that. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I was a I was a, a really good baseball player in high school. Um, um, I went to a, a private high school. My mom was, uh, I think, a little worried about me uh, academically. I, I wasn't always the greatest student. Um, I was diagnosed later. Uh, with with ADD, you know, back in 1983. And so I was in a small school setting. Um, uh, the, the school doesn't exist anymore, but we used to play schools like Fieldston and Horace Mann and stuff like that. So it was a private school setting. Um, but I was a starting shortstop in ninth grade on the varsity team. Um, uh, I was always a middle infielder and a pitcher or, or a left side infielder and a pitcher. Um, and had a really good high school career. I mean, I, I think I hit just under 600 as a senior, uh, but it was, you know, again, it was a small uh, school setting. I was a, a real um, good contact guy, um, really good hand control, but I was small, Wayne. I mean, I'm 6'1", 210 now. I was 5'8", uh, as a senior. I was 5'8", as a freshman in college. I didn't grow the other five inches until I was a freshman, so um, you know, I really didn't have any kind of power and it wasn't until later on, like in my twenties where I really, you know, started to feel a little bit more as an adult playing softball. So here's, this is a goofy question, but you know, when I think of you, you're the most people person ever. You're the most generous guy ever. Uh, I actually, before this hit ground balls to Zach short, my former player, uh, at sacred heart who just got released Friday from the Mets. And he's trying to stay sharp because he'll get picked up this week or right, not. Right. And I was just telling him, I'm, you know, I'm doing a podcast with Eric Holtz. He's like, oh, he's the he's the man, you know, like. So were you as outgoing leader in high school or did your personality as I know it develop as you grew up? Wayne, that's such a great question, man. I got to think about that for a second. You know, <laughs> when my dad died at 11, um, I was a tough kid. I was angry that he died. I didn't understand uh, at 11. I was kind of reckless in a lot of things that I did. Um, probably wasn't the great. I, I, I led by example. I wasn't a, a, a leader by words at that point. 
Um, I always worked. I always worked hard. I'd always ring the bells in Co-op City and ask guys to come down and hit me 500, 1,000 ground balls to get my work in. Uh, but I wasn't a real leader. I wouldn't say that that, that happened for, for, for many years. Um, I loved what I did, but I don't know that I, I was mature enough uh, to think that way. And, and um, I have an older brother who I love more than anything in the world, but he's not an, an athlete. Like he never picked up a ball of any kind uh, in his life. So I counted on other people and, and, and they were many years older than me, you know, three to five years older than me, kind of as other mentors and brothers. Um, so I was always kind of the little guy I was never in a leadership, I guess, position, um, you know, and, and in high school, um, I hate to say it, you know, looking back, it was probably more about me, you know, right. than it was about being a leader and, and getting guys to buy in together. Yeah, which is pretty typical. You know, I, I've told this story a few times, probably never on this podcast, and it's not that exciting. But, you know, I back in the late 90s, before I got back into a coaching job, I was doing my recruiting piece, which I'm really doing now. And my first ever client was a guy named Dan Orlovsky. So Dan Orlovsky then eventually went to UConn to play football, played 12 years in the NFL, mostly as a backup. And now he gets paid on ESPN to be a commentator. In the five times that I met him when he was a high school junior, he didn't say a word. He couldn't speak. He was so shy. <laughs> His dad did all the talking. And now he gets paid for it. So when I ran into him recently, I go, you know, people can change, man. Right. So. Right. Right. That, that's part of what this podcast is about and probably yours as well. It's like sometimes you're just so locked in when you're a younger kid to just you can only think about today and tomorrow. And you don't see the big picture of how much you can grow as a player and as a person. But back to back to, you know, we kind of left off of you in college when you started to grow. What was your you know, tell me about your college experience. So, again, I, you know, here's my brother who we knew was either going to be a lawyer or a doctor. I mean, that that was it. And he ended up being a lawyer. Um, I think I saw the movie Top Gun. I wanted to join the Air Force. <laughs> and 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 the truth is, um, I, I'm somewhat embarrassed to tell this story. I did go to the recruiting office and the Air Force wouldn't accept me because of my birth defect in my spine. So that goes out the window. Um, I'm diagnosed learning disabled. And there weren't a whole lot of schools that were right for me. Um, so I go to a, a, a junior college in Franklin, Massachusetts. It was the only school I, I applied to, and it was the only school, uh, therefore that I got into, uh, Dean junior college. It was called, it's now Dean college. It's a four year D three. Yeah. Um, I had probably the worst experience that anyone has ever had, uh, in the, in their career of baseball. Uh, I go there. I'm a little bit different. I mean, uh, you know, I was a kid from the Bronx. I, you know, you couldn't tell now, but like I had a full head of hair. <laughs> Half of it was dyed blonde. I had an earring in my ear. And and I looked a little bit different than the kids from, you know, Massachusetts and, and the New England area. Um, I was this really good shortstop. I was a pitcher. Um, I really didn't get an opportunity um, to show myself because the – senior sophomore but in Ju in, in, in juco they called a, a, him a senior uh he was kind of a a, a kiss-ass captain type guy and i just never got an opportunity to do anything and um a friend of mine was killed uh in a drunk driving accident on his 18th birthday uh for your fans and your audience probably hard to believe but there were no cell phones in 1984 i didn't have a phone i left my coach a note saying I had an emergency at home. I had to go home for the weekend. Um, I get back from uh, this kid's funeral. Uh, I go see the coach and he tells me to clean out his, my locker because I let my team down by leaving. So that was my college career uh, in baseball. It was over. Um, funny side story that is kind of funny to me, uh, not to my mom. I begged my mother not to put my birth defect on my medical records because it just became a pain in the ass as every season in high school, soccer, basketball, baseball, I would have to get notes from the, from doctors because they saw it on my record. So my mom gave in, she didn't put it on, on my record. 
it wasn't like I'm going to say, hey, mom, can you call the AD? I mean, this is 1984. Like, he doesn't want me. I'm out. Right. The next year, I walk onto the football team. <laughs> I wasn't supposed to play football. Oh. I didn't even know how to put the pads on. <laughs> Um, and, 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 and I walk on to Dean junior colleges, uh, football team as a free safety. Uh, I didn't get a whole lot of playing time, but I needed it. I needed it to stay involved, organized, regimented. Those are the things that for me are so important about playing sports, you know, past high school, um, you know, helping you really carve out what time you need to do certain things to get everything done. Uh, so I played my second year at Dean as a, as a football player. You know what? That's why these are great. I did not know that. That's fantastic. Yeah. You know, yeah. and football, it's funny. You know, football is one of those sports where you learn a lot of lessons playing football that you kind of don't learn in other sports, just with the, the team concept, I I think. But absolutely. Um, and then and then what was what was the move after Dean? So after Dean, I, I really started working. I, you know, um, it was funny. You know, you talk about me being this outgoing, generous guy. Um, my mom, uh, you know, rest her soul, I, she made about $18,000 a year. She was raising my brother and I on $18,000 a year. We we didn't get Hanukkah Christmas presents till December 26 when everything went half price because she couldn't afford them. Um, literally, I did not get new shoes till I had holes in my old ones. Um, so my motivation was to just earn. I needed to earn because I didn't want to live like that. So uh, originally, I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to be a phys ed teacher and a coach. Um, and I walked away from that after my second year and, and started working in the garment industry. And I did that, uh, you know, for about, God, 25, 27 years, um, which led me to this. But, um, you know, the, some, some, some great experiences. I've got to, you know, I really had gotten to see the world. Uh, cause I was very involved in the import business. Uh, so I really flew all over the world. Um, but you know, anyone I worked for, you know, when I started coach college baseball, like in Manhattanville college, you know, they, they, they didn't appreciate me leaving early to go to a game. You know, I had to leave work to go to games and practices. So the only way I could overcome that was start my own company. And that's what I did. So in 2000, I started my own company working for myself so that, you know, once my work was done, I always got my work done. But once my work was done, my customers knew they couldn't find me because I'd be coaching on the field somewhere. All right. So let's delve into that a little bit, because obviously this is really a sports podcast. It's baseball. We're talking about baseball development and, and coaching, et cetera. But I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Eric, and I don't want to speak out of turn. You were pretty darn successful as a business person, correct? I did okay. Yeah, I did pretty well. Okay. So what what lessons, you know, or how did you do it? What were the key things that made you successful doing that? Was it because you just were motivated to get money because you didn't have any? Was it your personality? What or hard work? Was it straight up that? You know, what was the it? original the original <laughs> The original thing may have been money. The original thing. Um, you and I are very similar, Wayne. We try to help kids overcome adversity in their lives. That's my why. That's what I do every day. It's the only reason I do what I do today. So I had a learning disability. So what? Right. right. That just meant to me... That I was different than you. I had to learn different than you. But here's what the deal was. You weren't going to outwork me. I was going to go twice as fast and twice as hard and not sleep and learn everything I had to learn so that I was going to be better than you. And that is really what motivated me um, in really in everything in my life. You know, if somebody kind of just thinks I can't, well, I'm going to show them I can. And, you know, with really, you know, no experience in, in, in the whole industry and in the whole garment industry, I started from scratch and, you know, really within, you know, 12, 13 years, I was the vice president of a really, really big company. And then, like I said, by 2000, I opened my own, but uh, you just weren't going to outwork me. And it, it, it remains the same today. 
And that's why I enjoy this because I didn't know you had a learning disability or because I only see you, see you as one of the more successful, happy people that I know. So it's a good message that you don't always have to come from the perfect situation, go to the perfect school. It's really the work ethic. And, you know, as a guy who spent his whole career working in colleges, I saw a lot of people waste a whole lot of money by being in college, not learning and just, you know, they're expensive. But so let's delve into this a little bit. So I first met you and you, we met each other back in, you know, the mid nineties when you were already on uh, the snow hunters softball team. And I joined this team. Now mm. I'll tell you this now, and I know this for sure. 98% of the people that are going to listen to this or watch this have no earthly idea what I'm about to describe because they play adult softball. People are drinking beers and there's a ball lofted into the air. This was not that this was central park guys throwing fast pitch, ridiculously talented players. And maybe there was some beers, but it was after there was no beers during. Right. So as like, even when I tell my friends now, it's just on a guy's weekend. And I'm like, dudes, you don't understand. I was playing fast pitch softball. Can you just describe your experience in that league? So, yeah, I mean, somebody hit Lou LaForge. Lou said, hey, do you play softball? I said, yeah, I do. You know, I play. Um, and he kind of looked at me like not knowing if I'd be good enough to join this team. And I'm like, like, dude, I, I, I'm a guy. Like, I'm a dog. Right. What, are, what, what are you saying? Right. So here I am. And again, you know, like I, I'm a left side infielder and I, I think I'm going to go there and just, you know, kill it. Guys today would never understand this was tenfold harder than hitting a baseball. Absolutely. From 43 feet away, you had these guys throwing slingshot. People don't know what slingshot is today, right? It's literally over the head. Some of those pitchers were pay-to-play guys that were showing up to try to beat us. And I could not break a position in the infield. I was a left fielder, left center fielder. You got guys like Doug Manfredonia and Linton. These guys were playing double A AA and triple A baseball, playing the infield on this team. Hands down, the best quality softball I had ever played in my life. No question. And here's the thing I always remember too. And I don't think I'm telling an urban legend. Please correct me if this happened or not. If the ball hit you, it was just a ball. You didn't go to first base, right? So like back in the in softball, that is the case. Yeah, I would get hit. I'd be like, all right, run it. No, 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 you stay. That was just the guy sending you a message because you were new in the league. You know what I mean? That's like, right. But but absolutely, and there's many stories about Jenny Finch facing Albert Pauls and blowing him away. Yeah, it was really you're right. It was really hard to hit at that league. Much harder, much harder than baseball. And I still play baseball. I mean, I'm still playing at 58. Uh, I, I'd rather, you know, face a guy throwing 95 right now than see one of those guys with the ball moving in, out, up, down from 43 feet away. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So once you then, you know, just as you described perfectly, hey, when you're leaving, working for someone else and you're cutting out early, it's a problem. But when you're running your own business. So what was the first transition into coaching? It was Manhattanville. So, yeah, Manhattanville College, I was more of a hitting guy. Um, it was Jeff Caulfield's first year, and I, I think he's been there now 20 years. This is his 20th year. So he needed an older guy, you know, a little bit older. Um, I was 38 at the time. He was probably 24, 25, um, you know, more of a morale guy for the guys, kind of an experienced type guy. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I was pretty involved in, in, you know, hitting with those guys. Um, I did that for three years. Um, I then moved over to coach girls softball at Manhattanville College. Some people don't know that as well. I coached with Dale Martin for a year. And it was that year that, that I got signed to go play overseas in Israel. And I had some real you know, decisions to make. Um, I'm going to kind of touch on that a little bit to go backwards so that you can then go forward. Um, when I got asked to leave baseball, um, playing baseball. I was angry, man. I, I, I was angry at baseball because it was the one thing, it was the one constant in my life that I loved so much. And I just felt like it turned its back on me. Um, and, and from 18 until 38, 
I didn't pick up baseball competitively. Uh, a really good friend of mine, Bob Irachi, said, hey, Holtz, let's go to Yankee Fantasy Camp. I had no idea what that was. I truly had no idea. So we go and most of the guys there are, are, you know, they're trying to get like autographs, stuff like that. Dude, I'm going hard. I'm still throwing probably low to mid eighties at 38 and, mm -hmm. and, and making plays in the hole and, and, you know, ex big leaguers, you know, Ken Griffey and Oscar Gamble and Tommy Tresh, these guys going, where did you play, man? Who are you? <laughs> I said, I, I'm nobody and I'm having fun. That's what I'm doing. Um, I have on tape somewhere, you know, hit the grand slam out of Yankee Stadium, you know, Steinbrenner Field with a wood bat. And um, we come back after doing this for a couple of years and we go, hey, you know, we should look for a men's league. I found out they're actually men's baseball leagues. Like, holy cow. So two years later, a buddy of mine says, hey, Holtz, they're having a, a pro tryout for this league in Israel. I said, Glenn, there's no baseball in Israel. He goes, dude, I'm telling you. I saw it in the New York Times. It's legit. I said, Glenn, there's no, no shot. <laughs> he shows me the article. The guy running it is Dan Duquette. Everybody knows Dan Duquette. Everyone. It's yep. up at Dan Duquette's facility in Hinsdale, Massachusetts. He's in between the Red Sox and the Orioles right now. So he's like the player agent, player manager, whatever, uh, for the Israel Baseball League. So I play a doubleheader on Sunday. The tryout's on a Monday. I run a 60. I take throws from the outfield. You know, typical college showcase, uh, six ground balls at, at, at play, BP. And then we do like, you know, uh, uh, a controlled scrimmage. So I get up. There's a kid probably about 18 years old, half my age, less than half. Fastball down the middle, strike one. Curveball, strike two. I step out. I go, blue, O two. 2 He goes, yeah. I go, I got him right where I want him. Now, the <laughs> kid is standing right behind the turtle with like, I scout from the Cubs and the, and the, and the Cardinals. And this kid tries to throw me an inside fastball, man. I just turn on this thing and just crush this thing through the six hole. And I, I can see Duquette, these guys shaking their head a little bit. And, and, and this guy's not even looking at me at first base, man. So I steal second. I'm 40 years old. I steal second. All right. <laughs> the day's done, man. It was like the most fun I ever had. And, uh, I'm leaving. I just said, hey, guys, man, this was awesome. I'm so happy I came. You know, thank you. And, and the guy goes, are you serious about this? And I go, you making me an offer? And he goes, are you serious, man? And I said, uh, have your people call my people. Thank you so much. This was great. I get in the car and I go, hey, babe, pack your bags. We're moving to Tel Aviv. Tracy's like, what are you even <laughs> saying right now? <laughs> Six months later, I get a contract email to me to go be a player coach in the first and only Israel baseball league. So that's how the whole forward part of the questions and stuff you had, that's how all this stuff started. So what year was that? So the trial was 2006. The actual league was 2007. Okay. So I'm not sure if I, so you act how many years, and I know that, but how many years did you do that? play in the israel baseball league yes one it, it only was for one year because it, it disbanded like everything else you know financial issues okay so at that point did you still have your own company at that point yes i was still running my clothing company okay so when did that transition to which i wanted i want of course we'll get back to the israel stuff but when did you get out of the you know the so clothing to, um, to get into game on so 2010, my mom calls me and, and, you know, again, cause this is my dad. My mom was just like my best friend and she lived like six miles away from me. And, and I planned it that way as she got older. Uh, and she called me up one day and she goes, babe, can you come over? I'm not feeling well. And I said, sure. And, uh, I looked in the toilet and her urine was almost brown. It was just like, man, what the hell is wrong with you? Uh, we got to get you a doctor. And it turned out she had pancreatic cancer. Um, taking my mom through her journey um, truly made me kind of look at my own. And having lost my dad when he was 51 and now, you know, knowing what the ultimate end was going to be for my mom, I kind of took a step back and just said, hey, you know, what is going to make me happy? 
every day for the rest of my life because I don't know how much time I have left. And whatever time that is, I want to use it for stuff that I want to do, not that I have to do. Right. And it was really at that point that I decided uh, baseball had always been my love and always been my passion. And 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 I was going to take a leap of faith and see what we could do with it. So get out of did you sell your business? I did not. I just kind of winded it down, uh, shipped, uh, you know, whatever last orders I had um, and and really just kind of winded down. I was more of an agent, so there wasn't a whole lot to sell. There was, the infrastructure was me, right? right? So it wasn't like there was a name to sell. Um, so I just kind of told all my customers what my plan was and, you know, just walked into the sunset type of thing. And I'm going to ask two questions, but the first is kind of describe because and the second one will be you got a nice setup going now. So I wanted you to talk about that. But then mm. it, it must have been not the easiest thing to get off the ground, getting this facility and starting these teams. Mm. So do this, do where you're at now. Obviously, you have game on facility in Elmsford, which is a beautiful indoor facility mm. and you're running a significant amount of teams. So just kind of give people watching listing an overview well, of what the current model is you know like anything else wayne I, <laughs> I you have these ideas right and and it's like throwing a a party and sending out all these invitations right you got great ideas but you don't know who's showing up to your party right so i put a tremendous amount of time effort money into setting up this facility uh it's just under 15,000 square feet um, I have nine cages and a full 3,200 square foot gym, um, all the latest technology and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, you know, depending on the season, I mean, we can have, you know, from 13 to 18 travel teams playing here now, 13 uh, boys, five girls softball, um, coaches that are passionate about what they do. And that to me is the most important thing. You know, I think for me being a dad and having three kids that went through all this stuff right the last thing you want to do as a dad is work with your own kids I never wanted to work with my own kids because there needed to be a separation of church and state so I give my kids to people that I respected and one thing I tell people all the time you cannot fake love you cannot fake passion you cannot fake the willing to want to break somebody down and teach them what they're doing wrong and how to help them because there are people they just show up they flip some balls they sit on a bucket they leave they go home and you know my son or daughter like literally just learned nothing so I knew or I had in mind what I wanted to do and here we are 10 years later and um I've done some things right for sure. Um, I'm never happy. I'm never satisfied. Um, I'm actually ripping the the entire place apart in two months, and I'm doing a full renovation um, on the entire facility, wow. um, and and kind of bringing it into you know like a a, a a a new time. I'm adding three cages and you know bringing in some some uh, you know additional gym equipment. Um, I want to teach the right way. Um, if you are about trophies, medals, banners, and plaques, go somewhere else. I don't care about any of that stuff. I want kids to fall in love with the game. I want kids to fall in love with the hard work it takes. I want kids to learn how to fail. In 2024, parents don't let their kids fail because, God forbid, my son or daughter had a bad day. They struck out four times. It was the umpire's fault. Uh, you made three errors. Your coach should have batted you set, uh, fourth instead of seventh. No. Parent your children, let them fail, let them learn, because after this game is over, they're going to be contributing to society. They're not going to be able to if they've never failed in their lives. Okay, we're going to take a short break right now with Eric Holtz, and we'll be back after these messages. Introducing ProMatter, the future of baseball training. With the PX3, you can practice like you play. There is a better way to train your athletes. 
with an easy to use touch screen controller, you can program any pitch, any speed, at any location. The ProBatter Simulator is designed to replicate real game, real world pitching. Better practice, better play. Hit any spot inside or outside the strike zone. The PX3 features reliable mechanics and an optional automatic ball feeder system. Get the most from practice. In addition to baseball, the PX3 is perfect for softball. With the PX3, no more relying on practice pitchers or basic pitching machines. Better practice, better play. Pro Batter. Train like it's game day. Step up to the plate with confidence. Hello, this is Wayne Mazzoni, host of And That's the Game podcast. I hope you're enjoying listening and watching the podcast as much as I am making it. It's really been enjoyable to connect with all these great people, great baseball people. Uh, the purpose of this message is to let you know about College Baseball Advisors, a company that I founded a couple years back after 30 years as a college baseball coach. I basically guide players and families through the recruiting process. If you're interested in learning more, please go to College Baseball Advisor dot com and learn more or book a call where we basically will meet and talk about your recruiting process. I'll lay out a three-step plan for you to move forward. If after that call you think I'm someone that can help you in this process, we can discuss that. If not, you just want to take that information and use it to go forward, that's great as well. So hope to see you down the road. Thank you. Okay, and we're back now after that short break. Here we continue our conversation with Eric Holtz. So this is a, per first of all, you know, and I have said this to you 50 times in person, but you are definitely the earliest wake up guy that I know, right? And you always post something immediately early when you wake up. And I basically look at it every day. And for those of you that don't know, and I'm going to ask you to give out your account if you don't mind, sure. because it's fantastic. There's always that message there that I, I think you're not that we could stereotype travel ball and not, but you're almost the opposite of it. You're like, basically you want the kids to grow up to fight for themselves and the parents to just not be lunatics. And that's what a lot of your messages are. And I love the way that you post about that. So could you, what is your, what social media do you post that on? So I, yeah, I'm on, uh, you know, Facebook under Eric Holt or Instagram, uh, Eric game on 13. Um, yeah. And, and, and again, you know, I try and keep it really positive. Sometimes parents just get me to a point where, you know, maybe I shouldn't have put that up or, but the <laughs> truth is like, it comes from the right place. Like just let your kids be kids. Stop reliving what you didn't have. You know, that to me, I get lawyers, doctors coming in here with a radar gun on a 10 year old. I have been known to grab them by the back of the neck, make them sit in their car, and I will t walk their kid out when they're done. Don't come in here and tell me how to do what I do. I'm not showing up at your office in the middle of a conference on Monday at 10 o'clock. Support your kid. The three most important words is I love you. Hey, it was so great to watch you play today. How many times do you hear that said? No. Dude, what are you swinging at? Oh, I, I, yeah, uh, what are you? Throw a strike. Yeah, because that's really, really positive, and that's really constructive because your kid's trying not to throw strikes, right. you moron. <laughs> Those are the things that just irk me, man. If. You, if these parents do these to this to the kid, we've chosen a game of failure. Right. You're going to fail so many more times than you're ever going to succeed. Learning never to accept, learning how to deal with failure. Because if I accept failure and I accept loss, I'm a loser. I have to learn. I tell, I, I tell kids of all ages, my favorite four letter word is not what you think, it's next. Next pitch, next to bat, next play, next girlfriend, next math test. Next. I can't go back and change what I did, but I can move from here, learn what my deficits are, and decide to either put the work in or not. Yeah, and you're, you're, you're saying it beautifully. I mean, I learned how to be a, a parent, a sports parent, by watching kids that I coached with great sports parents where, like, 
after a game, whether they had five hits or were 0 for 5 with five strikeouts, the dad just give him a hug. Hey, great to see you. Like, you just see that they're neutral, you know? And I get a lot of these videos from parents that are like, they're coaching their kid. Keep your elbow up. It's like, dude, this is the, the, the kid needs a break, man. They go into the field to be a kid. Like, yeah, they, it's serious, but the parent doesn't need to coach them every second. And even the kids I deal with on recruiting, if the parent is reaching out too much, I basically say, your kid's going to college to get recruited. He needs to be invested. You know, I don't right. mind the parent being involved. They right. care. They love their kids, but the kids got to want. I, I think that message is great. And actually on that note, you know, you for a guy with your, you know, background, right? You didn't go to the perfect four-year school and you didn't have a, tell us about your three kids and and how they turned out in terms of so, so athletically, this, academically, and probably your is, wife, you know? No, not probably. <laughs> 1,000% it's my wife. So Tracy and I have known each other since I was 10. She was nine. I broke her pinky playing dodgeball at day camp and she married <laughs> me anyway. Uh, we bet later on in life, we get married and, and we're getting ready. And she knew everything about me, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we're getting ready to get married and we're sitting out at dinner one night and she goes, babe, the only thing I ask can we never talk about what you did academically? You handle everything else. Let me handle the academic base. I said, Tracy, I love that idea. That's a great plan. So my older guy, um, six foot three at the time, 235 uh, through 92 and played at Bucknell. He's now a, 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 an attorney and he's made me a grandpa twice over. Um, my daughter uh, pitched at uh, NYU University uh, for two years. She's a, a pediatric oncology nurse, actually while planning a wedding and in school at Sacred Heart full time, getting her nurse practitioner's license. Uh, my younger son, Brett, um, had probably the worst experience of anyone, even probably worse than me. Uh, at Columbia University, he did go to Columbia University and play baseball there, uh, but his junior and senior year were the COVID years. So he lost his last two years of uh, baseball. And uh, but I, I, I truly, I'm, I'm blessed. Um, my wife and I have raised three really, really good human beings. Um, and you know, for me, it's, it's everything. You know, I mean, we, we do everything together. You know, we're Jewish, but we have. Big Sunday dinners every Sunday. Everyone is there every Sunday. Uh, we go on vacations together with the grandkids and the whole family. We just enjoy each other's company. Uh, but my wife did a hell of a job with the academic piece. And, you know, I I was always real, Wayne. You know, my, my daughter's kind of like, you know, probably one of my closest friends. She was my nurse. People don't know this. She was my nurse through all the qualifiers for Team Israel. So she was my roommate. Uh, so we shared a lot together. But I go back to 12, 13 U softball, and we'd be outside of Philadelphia. And uh, I'd go, hey, babe, I love you so much. <laughs> you were effing horrible today. <laughs> what are you going to do about it? And I'd wait for her to answer. Because now we had a two and a half hour ride home. <laughs> uh, and and it would think like, but I always told them I loved them. They yeah. knew, but you could still play like shit, but be prepared. I felt like Sydney wasn't prepared. Brett was prepared. Jordan was prepared. Sydney was good enough to be good enough. And man, did that irk me because she never yeah. had to put the work in. She was just naturally kind of more athletic. But uh, yeah, so that, that, that's my kids. Uh, greatest wife in the world, you know, the most supportive has, has let me, you know, really, really just chase any dream that, that I wanted to and stands by my side, you know, through everything. So, you know, just blessed. So let's go back to chase the dream. So to back to the, so obviously we talked about the Israel, the player, man, you know, player coach. Let's fast forward a bit. How about the Olympics? How, how in the world did that all come about and, you know, talk about that experience? Well, because everybody wakes up and says, I'm going to be an Olympian and it just happens. Right. <laughs> uh, I finished Israel baseball in 2007. 
and it's like six years go by and somebody uh nate fish who's who's like a little brother to me says hey holt i'm going back to israel i'm going to coach team usa in the maccabi games i had no idea what it was it was kind of like the jewish olympics uh he goes would you come back and be my coach and i said you know what let me ask tracy and and i asked tracy yeah go ahead we have tryouts uh on the east coast the midwest la we put together the hell of a team like including dean kramer pitching for the baltimore orioles right now like we, we got some guys. So I get to go back to Israel, man, which is like one of the most gorgeous places on the planet. Uh, I spend another three weeks there. And before I leave, um, the guy who's running this stuff, he says, Holt, would you come back in 17 as the head coach? I said, again, you know, let me ask the wife. Tracy says, yes, of course. Well, this is when the GM of Israel baseball reaches out to me and he says, Holt, I hear you're coming back to Israel. Can we meet for breakfast in the city? Absolutely, Peter. Peter says, listen, I, I heard you come back. Um, would you consider taking over as the head coach of our national team? No bullshit. I didn't know you had one. <laughs> what, what are you talking about, Peter? Pulls out this yellow pad. He starts writing names down. Tell me who we got at this position. Okay. And, and what are we doing with this team, Peter? He goes, well, if we win this, 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 and this, then we could be in the Olympics. I said, you're insane, but I'm in. <laughs> so 2017 comes, um, win the gold medal for USA on Tuesday. Wednesday, I become the head coach of Israel. I got five days to figure out who I got, what I got, pitchers, positions, hitters, lineups. We're going to Serbia, and, and we're going to play uh, in the B pool, right? As an A pool, B pool, C pool, we're in the B pool. My four hitter tears an oblique. <laughs> Good enough to catch, can't hit. Okay, he's batting ninth and button every at-bat of the tournament. Very long story short, we finished second to, I want to say, Austria. Um, have a great, great time in Serbia. We played Greece and Serbia, Bulgaria, a uh, bunch of, you know, pretty decent Bay, Austria. I go back to Israel. I got two days on the beach after being away from my family for six weeks. <laughs> Peter Kurz comes, meets me on the beach. He goes, Holtz, would you come back? I said, Peter, I'd come back, but man, we need to get better. Like I got men's teams back home that could beat this team. We need to find a way to get better. So luckily for Israel, luckily for me, something magical happened. Team Israel comes in sixth in the world baseball classic. All these guys bought in Jerry Weinstein's the coach and they come in sixth. Well, now all these guys are interested in staying involved with Israel baseball. So I got single A, double A, triple A, indie ball guys. Can't take MLB guys, right? Because it's in the middle of the season. But the difference, the biggest difference between WBC and, 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 and Olympic qualifiers is to represent a country, you have to be a passport holder of that country. World Baseball Classic, heritage only. I have to prove heritage. Right. So every one of these guys from the WBC now has to become an Israeli citizen to play for Team Israel. Well, my team's immediately upgraded. Wayne. I mean, I, I got I got triple A pitchers, double A center field. I, I, team is from what it was. Right. But that doesn't mean anything because now we still got to put them on the field and play. It would take too much time to walk you through specifics, but. We, we show up in Bulgaria 2019. We run the table um, against Bulgaria, Serbia, Ireland. We beat Russia twice who cheated. How did they cheat? Their entire infield was Cuban. They were given national cards. They were speaking Spanish. The entire infield speaking Spanish. We beat them twice. Uh, we now have to go to the other pool winner, Lithuania. We go to Lithuania. We beat Lithuania twice. For the first time in the history of Israel baseball, we get out of the B pool. We're now in the A pool. I get a week home. I go right to Germany. Um, we're in Germany playing against all really good 
baseball teams, great baseball countries with 4 and 0. Only 5 out of 12 teams make it to the Olympic qualifiers with 4 and 0. Mathematically, we're fifth. We're, we're fifth. I'm doing this a million ways in my head. We're fifth no matter what. Well, <laughs> we now play the Netherlands. And they just destroy us. I mean, <laughs> I, I want to say it's like 13-4. The next day we have Spain. Luis Soho is coaching uh, the head coach of Spain. It's like a mid softball game. The, the, fat, the slow pitch. It's like 16 9 is the final. And then Italy walks off on us in the bottom of the ninth and beats us like 8 7. We're limping into the Olympic qualifiers. People looking at us like, you know, like, like we didn't belong there. We're like the Jamaican bobsled team of, <laughs> of, of European baseball. But the first game is against Spain. Spain. Right, they just kicked the crap out of us 16 9. Joey Wagman goes out against Spain, throws a nine inning complete game shutout. We beat them three nothing. Spain refused to shake our hands, nothing anti Semitic. They were just sore losers. Right into the Netherlands, would beat us 13 to four. John Muscat goes out, gives me four and two thirds, one run ball. We beat the Netherlands. I want to say it was like seven one. Right. Holy shit. Like this is happening, man. And just like baseball is, you know, you start looking into tomorrow and we got the Czech Republic and we, we just beat the Czech Republic uh, in Germany last week. They had our number. We couldn't do anything. I felt like they had our signs. Like that's how well they were seeing the ball and uh, and they beat us. So the next day we go and we have Italy in Italy tie game in the eighth inning. I forget the kid's name now. You probably remember because you're great with names. The ambidextrous pitcher that had played for the Yankees uh, minor league. Says, uh, oh, Venditti. Pat Venditti. Pat Venditti comes into a 2-2 game. I got a, a not a great runner on third base. We lay down a safety squeeze against Venditti. And we go on to score five runs. We beat Italy in Italy. 6-2, 7-2, something like that. 8-2. Well, now... Because of the head-to-heads, all we got to do is beat South Africa tomorrow. And holy shit, we're going to the Olympics, man. So when you're dealing with, like, older guys, pro guys, you're not really, like, a rah-rah. Like, like they, don't, they, don't, they don't need that stuff. Right. But we get on the bus, and we're about five minutes from the stadium. And I, I ask the, the driver to turn the, the, the music off. And I stand up on the bus, and I go, boys, if all we do is do our job today, we leave the hotel, the baseball team, and we return to the left. <laughs> and the bus just goes crazy, man. <laughs> and poor South Africa, we ended up gonging them. Uh, we beat them 11 to 1 in seven innings or something like that. And for the first time ever, right, little old Israel is one of six teams that are going to go play in the, uh, the, uh, the Tokyo Olympics. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Crazy. Crazy. And so, I mean, just, and now in 2024, is there any, is there anything you're still doing with that group or is that all now in the past? So, yeah, I stepped down after the Olympics, you know, I had given five years of my life and it's a big commitment. And, you know, again, I'm really happy doing what I'm doing here. And I have my kids and my grandkids here. Um, I do a lot. I do a lot behind the scenes. Um, helping them set up the future of Israel baseball, which a lot of it is coming here into the States now. Uh, they're setting up all kinds of camps, clinics, uh, fantasy camps, like like uh, Israel fantasy camps that are going to be in Florida. Uh, so, yeah, I do stay involved. Uh, my son, uh, Brett, actually played on the national team. He got his citizenship about two years ago, uh, and it, it killed me because I had had my hip replaced September 14th, and the Tournament started September 17th. So I was watching my son compete against guys like Didi Gregorius and, and stuff like that. And he hit really well. I think he hit just under 400 for the tournament. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I, I am staying involved. I will stay involved as long as they want me to. 
Um, I'm a big believer in helping the next generation and, you know, just kind of passing the torch. All right. So that, which is unbelievable, but here's just the, the kind of two other things I wanted to ask you one specific and then one sort of open-ended one. Um, how did the whole Montefiore advertising campaign, I mean, here it was my boy on the radio and then I'm driving on the highway and there he is on the signs. How did the whole Montefiore you know, advertising thing come about? All right. So about 30 years ago, um, I was lucky enough to meet a, a gentleman, play, play softball against a gentleman named Martin Levy, Dr. Martin Levy. And I refer to him over the years as all the king's men. I'm Humpty Dumpty. He's all the king's <laughs> men. And every time I would break, Dr. Levy would put me back together and, um, at 39 years old, I had ripped, uh, torn my labor, ripped off my biceps tendon. And at that time, you know, probably, oh God, you know, you're looking at like 2005, like almost 20 years ago, they didn't want to do that type of surgery to older guys, right? They figured you're done. Like, you know, if you don't need it for work, what, you know, right. whatever. I begged them. I said, dude, I have so much more left to do. Um, so he puts me back together and I rehab and um, a couple of years go by and Montefiore asked me if I would do kind of a thing for them. So, you know, if you Google Eric Holt slash Montefiore, it was like just a short for Montefiore. Well, then a year goes by, I hear nothing. And Montefiore says that the Yes Network sees the story and now they want to do something together. I swear to you, Wayne, this is true. Because I love the doctor. He's like a big brother to me. Yeah. I signed everything away as a kind of a thank you to him. I barely as much got a thank you from Montefiore. Wow. I ended up being on every Yankee game, billboards, magazines, newspapers, radio, for the entire season, you know, where it became a nightmare, man. I I was getting ready to fall asleep and listen to the Yankee game. I'd hear my voice and start cringing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but that that's really, really how this whole thing happened. Okay, got it. So is that that doctor still in practice? He is. He is still in practice. Um, he he's he's just the most wonderful surgeon and 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 doctor and friend, more importantly, friend. Um, he doesn't, he hasn't done my, my replacement parts, uh, but, but he is, uh, you know, the, the king of ACLs and shoulders and stuff like that. Okay. All right. And then for my last thing, is there any, whether it's something about you that I didn't ask that you want people to know or a story or, or just a life lesson or any kind of parting shot to a young player, a young coach watching that, you know, could help them. Um, I'm going to tell you at this point, you, you pretty much know uh, as much as you'd probably care to know. Um, but what I love most about what I do, as I said earlier, I want to help kids learn that it's okay to fail. If I didn't fail, I didn't try. You may fail three, four, five times until you get something right. But it's the old Rocky, you know, punch me seven times. I'm going to get up eight. I'm going to figure this out until I get to where I want to get. But that being said, my message to kids, Wayne, and I'll leave you with this. I'm not satisfied. At 58, I wake up wondering what I could do to get better. How? Better as a coach, better as, as a father. Well, now better as a grandfather, better as a business owner. What can I do to help more people? And if I feel that way as I approach 60, these kids have to wake up in the morning at 10, 12, 14, 16 years old and ask those same questions. How can I be better? I can be a better sibling, a better student, a better uh, uh, friend to my friends. I can get involved in the community. I don't have to play as many video games. What can I do to get better? So for me, if every it's like the team concept. If everybody buys in and they try to get better, well, how good is the team going to be? 
that's us as a society. If we don't get com comfortability is what kills. Being too comfortable, sitting your fat ass on the couch, that's what kills. Continue to strive to get better at something. Because when you are satisfied, to me, you're done. Yeah, no, I like that for, for two things. I think one is, you know, the growth mindset. Like there are people who are, you know, 13 and they're bad at math. Let's, you know, they're legitimately not getting good grades. Well, they'll tell themselves, well, I'm just not good at math. I can't do math. As opposed to, well, I just haven't figured out math yet. Like I'll eventually get it. You know, it's that growth mindset. And even the book Atomic Habits by the guy James Clear. I have it. You have, yeah, you have to be very careful even how you identify yourself, you know, I'm not a runner. How do you know you're not a runner? Like we say these things, but yet there isn't any legitimacy to these things. Well, no, I, I can't hit a good slider. Not you, you can't yet, but, or I can't throw a good slider. Well, right. I can't yet, but right. How many guys can, can develop later in life, but you're right. It's true. I think that's something you learn in adulthood is that constant growth, the constant learning, but truly it is, it is, a younger kid. And I don't think I was this way younger. I don't think at 13, I, I, I learned to get a grade. I didn't learn to learn, you know? So I think that is a good message to say, Correct. Hey, how can you grow? Even when you're younger is something you can carry through your whole life for sure. 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 All right, my friend, it was awesome. For people interested, check out game on 13, the facility, the teams, uh, Eric Game On, right, is the is the Instagram. Eric Game On 13 at Insta or just Eric Colt on Facebook. Um, and thanks for having me, man. This is great. Yeah, and I want I wanted to say one final thing, which is and I know you well enough to say this for you. You're not you don't wake up in the morning going, I need more followers. I'm saying that people should follow if they want to actually get something that will be impactful every single day, they should follow you as well as your podcast. Tell them about your podcast as well, Eric. Yeah, so we started uh, this podcast. Uh, one of the dads came to, to see me speak at a purchase first pitch dinner, and he said, dude, you were just incredible. And, and I said, Dave, I was talking about me and baseball. Like, you know, that's easy. And he said, no, you know, why don't we try and do something? And that's what he does. He's a video production guy. Uh, so he comes in here. And, you know, for me, it's easy to talk about guys when they're successful. I want to hear the other stories. I want to hear, um, you know, what it was like uh, for instance, I had Danny Valencia on a couple weeks ago, 10-year big leaguer. Uh, tell me about how you were riding high playing for the Blue Jays, and then you get traded to the Oakland A's. You know, it, 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 it's second-guessing myself. It's learning how to overcome the feeling of, oh, I'm letting my parents down and, and mental health. And, and again, it's stuff that we talk about. So for me, that's what I try and do every week is have a different guest on to talk about their how and why. What got them here? Um, how do you deal with failure? Who do you talk to? What do you rely on to try and help them through whatever they're going through? And can you just give out the name of it and where they can find the podcast? Yeah, so right now it's uh, it's called 90 Feet Away, 90 Feet Away Podcast. Uh, you can find it on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, uh, any of the big uh, you know deals. But we have... Uh, and it's not just baseball, softball. I have uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we did a, a really neat spot with uh, Jamie Loeb, a USTA tennis player. Um, and again, we've had just some, you know, mental health professionals in addition to, you know, athletes as well. And, and as long as I can keep helping people, I'll keep doing it. Awesome. All right, buddy. Thank you so much for your time. And I'll see you in two weeks in the podcast. And I hope to come in and do it in person as opposed to remote, if I can make oh, it. Oh, hell yeah. That'd be fun. Thank you for having me and uh, have a great day, Wayno. All right, buddy. Thanks. All right, man. Thank you, everyone, for listening to this episode of And That's the Game podcast, sponsored by Pro Batter Sports. Again, this is your host, Wayne Mazzoni. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Eric Holtz, and we very much look forward to seeing you on our future episodes. Thank you. For more information about Pro Batter Sports, visit them on the web at probatter.com. I'm ready.